Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode. And today, do we have a treat for you? We're going to be talking about the life of the unborn child and how to defend it, what God's been doing. Let's get into it. All right, everybody, so glad that you are back and can't wait for you to meet this man. Um, we met six, seven months ago, and uh, I want to introduce you guys to David Ripley, uh, who is honestly a, a local, I, I don't know if I want to say hero, but that's a big word, um, but but truly fascinated at just who you are, the story you have, and how God's redeemed some things in your life, and then how he's using you now. So greatly just respect you, love what you're doing for the Lord and for the unborn. Um, but who who are you? <laughs> How'd you even get here? Because you're not native to Idaho, if I remember correctly. Right. Uh, you were sent here kind of on a mission. Is that accurate? Yep. Yeah, uh, I think that's fair to say. Um I was sent here in 1984 by the National Democratic Committee and uh, the National Education Association to work on a congressional campaign for a Democrat in the Idaho Second District, and uh, we managed to win that race. I think he was the first Democrat elected to Congress in since World War II or something like that. It was pretty historic, and um, I decided to stay and. Uh, founded the first uh, Democratic political consulting firm in Idaho. In fact, I'm pretty sure, I'm not even sure there's another one. So when I folded that, that might have been the one and only one. I'm not really clear about that. But anyway, you know, I got to Idaho. I was a um, card-carrying socialist. Um, turns out I never met the man that I can remember, but uh, Barack Obama and I were both members of the Democratic Socialists of America about the same time. And uh, when I was in college in Minnesota, I organized, I was a field organizer for them, organizing campuses, you know, for Democratic Socialism, which is socialism, period. <laughs> and um, as I explained to you over breakfast, um, you know, I, I, I bought all of it, you know, um, politics was my religion, um, and whatever the Democratic Party was for, I was for, and a lot of that was, you know, looking back, was fairly mindless in a weird way, um, particularly on the abortion issue. I'm a person that was uh, came of age under Roe, really. You know, I would have been, uh, I suppose, in junior high school when Roe was handed down. So as I was, you know, going through adolescence and all those issues of high school and college, you know, relationships and women and sexuality and all that, it had a pretty profound effect, I think, in terms of how I viewed all those things. Of course. Right? And, um, but... Largely, it was portrayed with, the, and I think it still is actually within the Democratic Party, as a matter of a woman's right to choose. Right. Right. So basically, I only thought about it as deeply as well. I'm for women, and I think they should have equal rights, and therefore they should be able to kill their babies. Which, you know, if you think about it for any length of time, that doesn't make any sense, right? One does not follow the other. Sure. But Democrats and liberalism and, you know, is a really a spiritual disease, to be honest about it, and it certainly was in my case. Now, it seems to be a very subtle philosophy. I, I'm guessing you don't see it coming, especially being junior high age and, you know, Roe is passed and kind of beginning to transform the minds of many, many, many people. Did you realize that that one case was changing how you viewed things? Or were you kind of... No, I actually think uh, I... For people that would have been older, right, um, maybe who were already in college or or older, they would have seen, and certainly, you know, people of my parents' age... 
were aghast at Roe, right? For me, uh, and I think people of my age category and younger, we didn't have, that was the norm, right? We became adults with that as part of the framework of reality, right? You wasn't no different. Right. You know, largely, we never thought much about abortion, per se. It wasn't a topic of conversation. But it certainly, looking back, it certainly impacted how we viewed relationships, how we viewed sexual our sexuality. Um, promiscuity, of course, is the handmaiden of <laughs> abortion, sure, sure, right? Yes. And, and really, a, you know, the truth of the matter is that abortion is the fruit of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll theology of the 60s and 70s, right? Um, there are consequences to having free love, which nobody really wanted to talk about, right? Suddenly you had problems with sexually transmitted diseases, um, destroyed hearts and and lives, really, and then you had pregnancies, right? Who knew that fooling around that, that way could result in actually having babies, right? And right. so um, Roe was sort of a, almost a necessary co corollary to the free love movement. And, but we thought about, you know, as an adolescent and a young man, I thought about the free love part. I didn't think about the abortion part, sure. right? And in fact, I think it's true that looking back on how I thought about the things at that time in my life, um, especially without God or Christ having redeemed my mind and soul, I mean, I was, uh, you know, at the mercy of the culture. Um, looking back at it, it's pretty clear to me that... Um, I never really thought much. I never thought it through, right? So we, we, uh, we all thought of ourselves, especially as I became, you know, in college, politically active, and I became, I began a political career, which has lasted my whole adult life. Oddly enough, <laughs> um, I began advocating for candidates and and women's rights and so forth, and that was just part of the package. And, in fact, I had a tremendous impact in the Democratic Party of Idaho when I set up this consulting firm. Right. I started working for Democratic candidates, trying to get more Democrats elected to the legislature. I had access to quite a lot of money, and I was pretty good at it. And we did manage to win a lot of races. People don't realize this today, and it seems kind of... Um, incredible, but there was a time when de when the Democratic Party had a uh, parity with the Republicans in the Idaho State Senate. It was a tied Senate coming out of the 1990 election, and we were on the verge of actually having a Democratic legislature, which is hard to believe, but it's true. No, I absolutely believe it. And I don't know how much of that, right? You lived through it. You helped influence and start really part of that. You were the first spark that began that fire. But you see uh, the result of when people coast or assume that since things are good, they'll stay good. And I don't know how much of it was a result of that, um, of the Republican Party or the more conservative people just thinking, well, we're conservative, so that's just how it will always be. And asleep at the wheel, so to say. Yep. And when we're asleep at the wheel and have our feet up and we're coasting, right, you take your armor off, is when the advancement of these spiritual issues, as you put them, almost have free reign, unopposed at first. Right. And then, then, then righteousness wakes up and puts its armor back on, but the battle's already on. You're catching up now to this more spiritual liberal ideology. I think it was fascinating you shared, you know, you were just subject to the culture you grew up in and the adults of the time were were shocked and appalled at what was happening, but you didn't know better. 
I, I've been having this reoccurring thought for years now that while there's issues of our time that we disagree with back in 2008 and the shift in marriage and what was acceptable, now it's sexual identity itself. An adult who knows better is appalled and and it's almost hard to believe people believe it. Right, right. But what I'm most interested in is my kids, right? They're growing up and unless we're telling them different, they wouldn't know differently. And the necessity of older people speaking truth into the lives of the next generation, the necessity of not being quiet. If, if there is ever a time to lovingly be loud, right? Not vehemently be loud, lovingly, but loud for truth and for what's right. Um, so kind of want to go back. It, it's wild to me knowing you now and knowing what you're, you've been doing, especially recently and what's coming up this year for you. Uh, but then you stated you are a, a card carrying, committed socialist, propagating the cause and really, really good at it. And you were sent here to begin to turn the state of Idaho as blue as you could. And we're good at doing that. And it was working. Yep. But that is no longer who you are now. Well, I, I guess you could say I got mugged by reality. <laughs> okay. Um, several years uh, in 1994, it's about four years after that, that 1990 election in which we almost took over the state senate. Um, the woman I was married to at the time, uh, we, we, we wanted a child and were happy about getting pregnant. And within a couple of months of that pregnancy, uh, she changed her mind. And the marriage hit, you know, a crisis point, and she announced that she wanted to abort the baby. And that was the first time that I really began to confront what abortion was. And I, I guess I had always limited my thinking about abortion to young people getting pregnant, fooling around, you know, in high school, somebody getting pregnant, nobody's ready for that. And so that's a convenient and easy way to deal with the problem. But this was a marriage situation. I wanted the child. I had already seen him on an ultrasound. There was no question in my mind that it was a baby. It was my baby. And... Um, and I remember going to, I had developed a network of Democratic f friends, lawyers, and so forth, and I began calling them and trying to meet with them and asking them what I could do to save his life. And they were appalled by how stupid I was. And, and in fairness, I was pretty stupid because I... I, I did not really comprehend that Roe meant that I didn't really exist. I had no rights as a father. I had no rights as a husband. I had no rights to go to court to defend him. I had no, I mean, I didn't exist as far as the law was concerned until and unless he was actually born. So in the court, in the you know, in the eyes of the court, court system, the legal system under Roe, I only became a father after a live birth. I was not even a part of the equation until that moment. And so I was reduced to begging for his life, really, with the, a jury of one. And I lost, and I've, I, she made the appointment, and the and the day that he was killed by an abortion, I, I had hit rock bottom really, and I, by that time, was working for the Idaho Education Association full time. And I was on the road up north to do some campaign work and um, decided that I was going to end my life because I 
<laughs> for one thing, I could not deal with the guilt of being unable to protect him. But as I was confronted in a matter of, you know, a crucible of days, with what I had been doing with my life, it wasn't, it was clear that I wasn't just guilty in his case. Mm. I was guilty of helping to destroy an unknown number of lives by advocating for abortion and defending those who did. And it was pretty overwhelming. And uh, so I, I parked up in the St. Joe and took a bunch of drugs and, uh, you know, laid down in the back of my truck and waited to die. But the Lord had a different plan. And the sun came up in the St. Joe and I wasn't dead. I felt terrible. <laughs> Sure, <laughs> and I mean I was, but I had sp I was spent. I was spent physically, emotionally, spiritually. My life was pretty much destroyed, and uh, but I realized that God was not going to let me die. So I had to. I crawled into Coeur d'Alene, got a hotel, a motel there on Sherman Avenue, and. Um, tried to recover and the only the only thing I had really was the uh, Gideon's Bible left in that room wow and um, I spent several days there um, trying to recover physically and emotionally and realizing that I had to find a different way to live because my way was not going to work anymore and clearly hadn't worked and I needed him to help me figure out how to live, period. And within a few days of that, um, I told the IA that I couldn't work for them anymore because there was just no way that they would accept my pro-life politics. And... Um, and it took a while, but I, I realized that I had to do something to make amends for what I had been doing, you know, for years with, with the skills I had in politics. And and I began to, um, I didn't really have any pro-life friends. I mean, they were all my enemies, <laughs> sure. right? So I didn't really have anybody to talk to except for people that I had been, that I had been engaged in combat with over the years, you know, politically. Yeah, what a rapid shift in thinking, right? Really, it's, this was not years of thinking and hearing. This was no, it days. Was, it, literally, yep. And your entire life was turned in a completely different direction. Well, it was a it was a rude. Yeah, I can't imagine crash the into the wall. Uh, yeah. uh, and of course, once. And I didn't, you know, it did take years for me to begin unraveling liberal thinking, sure. you know, in all parts of my life and whatever, and the things that I had, that I had just sort of absorbed without thinking about, sure. right? But that was a crash course in reality. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I met, I met the truth, and then I met the author of the truth, <laughs> and. Um, and he was very gracious, and he and he picked me up and snatched me from, you know, the plans for destruction that Satan had laid for me, and and then even more graciously gave me something to do, something worthwhile to do. And within a few months, I started Idaho Chooses Life, and um, that was in uh, the winter of 1995. And by God's grace, I've continued to be at that work ever since. And we're uh, soon to mark our th 30th anniversary, yeah. which is kind of astounding. <laughs> well, it's not, it is very astounding, really. <laughs> and, um, you know, if I, I remember when uh, it became clear that he wanted me to do this, I, you know, I argued with him about some of it because it didn't seem like I was the right person 
for one thing, I was a male and I was white and I was, you know, damaged. And it didn't seem like I was the right demographic to do this kind of work, right? Sure. And turns out God doesn't need a political consultant. So he had a different plan. And, and I realized over time that, in fact... One of the great lies that got that sustains abortion to this day, but going all the way back to the beginning of this, of this great, terrible experiment with destroying our own future. One of the great lies that Satan perpetrated on the society was declaring that abortion is a woman's issue, mm. that it's that men have nothing to say about this, that. Men, in fact, have no right to an opinion, even, and most men, even within the within the body, have been cowered into submission and fear on that, and have absorbed some of that, maybe a lot of it, yeah. to think that they are. It's just not their place to to have an opinion. They might have a personal opinion, but it shouldn't be expressed publicly because they're. They're a man, of course, and so their thoughts and feelings and righteous indignation is inappropriate. But the truth is, we know from Scripture, that's exactly backward. That's right. That's exactly backward. Yep. And I have had this burden for the whole time I've done this work to speak to Christian men about the issue because we are failing women. The abortion issue is, I would even go so far as to say, primarily a man's issue because it goes to the heart of how we have failed women, how we have failed to protect them, how we have failed to honor them uh, with our sexuality. For example, we've We've created this culture now in which men are free to prey upon women as objects for gratification. Yep. And we have no responsibility for what happens afterwards. We have we have allowed Satan to remove us, making women pray for not only men, but for him. So that Satan can then prey upon women who are left to deal with the consequences of this, right? Whether they choose an abortion or to raise a child by themselves, they are the, they are left to their own devices. That's not how God ordered this. That's exactly how it's not supposed to be. Correct. And um, I think until we we cannot win this battle for life, until men in the church stand up and become men again. And what a powerful message and accurate. There, There's no doubt about it. Throughout society, no matter what culture it is on the globe, just throughout human history, where there is strong male leadership, which doesn't mean domineering, tyrannical right. lording, but strong leadership to provide and to protect, to take care of, to lead and to guide, then you see a very strong, healthy society. When man is dethroned, in a sense, or or relinquishes his role, his responsibility to to truly lead how the Bible describes a man to lead is right. hard work. It's uncomfortable. It's often intimidating and goes against our own nature. And so it's easy and to it's sacrificial. It's right? extremely that well, and that's the whole point. If it is intimidating, we don't want to do it. If it's hard, that means it goes against what's natural. That when you want to sleep in, you don't get to. When you want to shy away from confrontation, you don't get to. Uh, when you're going to get made fun of or mocked or lose a position, then you're going to get mocked, made fun of, or lose a position. So true biblical leadership is extremely expensive. It costs you your emotions. It costs you your comfort. It may cost you even tangible opportunities in life. Yeah. But when you do it, you see that disseminate across the board and make an entire civilization stronger, healthier, and better in almost every way. Um, 
whether that's economics, whether that's mental health, whether that's the structure of family. I mean, it, 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 it permeates everything, everything in the whole world. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head saying that this is actually a men's issue and we're to step back and re-engage. And as you say these kinds of things, and I'm sure this isn't the first time you've said it, how is that message received? I, I can't imagine standing in a crowd and hearing, I, I would love to be there one day and watch you say this is a man's issue and see how the crowd responds. Well, how's that going? Um so I've spent um, 30 years, a lot of that is in political action work, but it's all about five, six years into the ministry, I began to take a more active role at, at the legislature at actually lobbying. Primary, you know, when we started it, I was focused on, I, I knew that pro-life candidates, especially for the legislature, the pro-life community is terrible. It's, in fact, in some ways, it still is terrible. We're very good at making demands on politicians, but, but then we leave them to their own devices out there. Um, and as they get run over by well-financed opponents and you know national organizations who can dump a bunch of money and volunteers and whatever. And so I realized that those candidates who were willing to take a stand for life had to be supported in practical ways. We had to raise money. We had to get people out there helping them with their campaigns and so forth. Um, but within a few years, I I was frustrated by how the effort was being conducted at the legislature, what kinds of bills were being presented, and how what I thought we could do a much better job at building, rebuilding a wall of protection you know, one brick at a time to build to the point where we could in, once again welcome babies back into the human family, right? Thank you for tuning in to Ready or Not. We will resume the discussion on this important topic in our next episode. <laughs>